a judge turned around to one of the uh, girls in my group and said, I don't deem your dad to be a predator because he kept it in the family. Hello, and welcome back to Crime Suspect. Each week, we unravel some of the UK's most prolific crimes, as well as providing in-depth analysis on the criminality that plagues our nation. On the show today, lawless vigilantes or safeguarding angels? In response to what they claim is an epidemic of grooming in the UK, online child abuse activist groups, better known as paedophile hunters, are on the rise. But are they making things worse for the children they want to protect? Next up, we'll be bringing you the best and worst of policing with our good cop, bad cop. And finally, it's your chance to book a crook as we show you this week's Wanted Criminals. Joining me for all of this today is criminologist and author James Treadwell, criminal barrister Oliver Doherty, and paedophile hunter from the Guardians of the North, activist Joe Jones. Thank you all very much for being here. Now, you have the right to remain watching. This is Crime Suspect. They've been dubbed the X-Men of child exploitation. Online child abuse activist groups pose as vulnerable children in chat rooms waiting for men to start talking before encouraging them to meet them in order that they can publicly expose them. Last year, the National Society for the Protection of Children reported an alarming 82% rise in online grooming crimes against children over the last five years. And the surge in anti-paedophile vigilantism reflects a growing perception that these activist groups are stepping into a void left by law enforcement. But while paedophile hunters may have some public benefit, this can often be outweighed by the serious legal and moral problems that their actions pose. Not to mention the added risk of accidentally accusing the wrong person. James, should we be relying on vigilantes like Joe to be doing the police's work? I think the reality is it, it's, it, it's a reliance that's born out of the fact that there really is, at the moment, no alternative. If we look at the numbers, and those NSPCC figures are, are staggering, that, that is, in some ways, the, the tip of an iceberg. Because if we look, for example, at child sexual exploitation material in possession of people, we can suspect that those people are, are probably mostly men. But we know that we, we prosecute a tiny number CEOP, the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Agency, suggests that at any given time could be somewhere between 600,000 and 800,000 people in the UK who are accessing child sexual exploitation material. I mean, it's, it's a, a shockingly high number. And in many ways, if we think about policing and what we want the police to do, we want the police to police our roads, we want them to police burglary, we want them to police violence in our city centres, we want them to police sexual offences, you know, we want them to protect MPs at home, we want the police to do everything, and yet there will always be that tension in that we don't have enough police. And when the police aren't doing something which concerns the public, and I would suggest that it isn't a moral panic, People are rightly concerned about child sexual exploitation and, and the harm that, that's going on in society. People like Joe will, will step in and, and fill the void, and that is just a reality. Joe, yep. there's staggering figures, possibly 600 to 800,000 people, mainly men, yeah. accessing this yeah. material. So I take it you're not short of suspects that you can... Uh, we've got over 400 convictions. Um, and we're still ongoing. Um, it's an epidemic, it really is. Um, I mean, there's over 100 groups in the country and there was one last month called 53 people in a month. So how can you justify where's the police? Understandably, they're, they're short-funded, understaffed, and the fact is there's no monetary gains from paedophile hunting or locking up a paedophile. If it was a drug dealer, yeah, there's, you could seize assets. There's nothing like that. And the amount of money that's been put in to, uh, to these operations, the cybercrime units, 
just isn't enough. Is not enough. What got you into this work in the first place? My son was um, contacted. Uh, he came up to me when he was 13. He's 21 now. Um, he says, Dad, some of these messages are not online. Swear, give us a look. So I went straight to the police. Not just once, twice. Done nothing. Couldn't do nothing. I went home. I was a helpless parent. I didn't know what to do. Turn that way, turn that way. What, what did I do? Did I let my, ben, my son get abused in his own, own home via the internet because the police are not doing what they need to do? And like I say, here we are today, seven and a half, nearly eight years later, over 400 convictions, the proof's in the pudding. You know what I mean? It's... So tell me, Joe, how do you go about catching these people? Well, first of all, we'll ask uh, people over the age of 18 if we can have their photographs, donate their photographs to us um, from when they were in school. So we've already got their permission to use them photographs. We'll put them online, make us uh, a profile. We'll just wait for somebody to message us. When they message us, because we'll never message them first, we'll never make first contact, we'll allow them to carry on the chat whichever way they want to carry it on, whether it's football, whether it's sex, whether it's this, that and the other. We'll never encourage them. We'll never, like you said earlier on, encourage them to meet. We'll never do. And if we possibly can, we'll get them... They will come out and meet. If not, if it's a family home, the reason I send police in to a family home and not do a live stream... I've never did live streams, I'm dead against them. Um, is because the only victims in this crime is the paedophiles' families. Don't try and make an escape. Why you've, am ca you've, escape? Ca you've came here tonight to meet a child for the purpose of sex. I did not even know the age of the person. So your friend did not tell you that this child was 14? No. So you clearly behave in a very responsible well, way. Yeah, yeah. Do you then present your evidence to the police? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, before we go out, um, We'll have an evidence, evidential pack already okay. made. We'll take a laptop with us. Okay. Um, police can take up to half hour, an hour, two hours, three hours. Just depends. We're not classed as a priority. Um, and we've got to have these people under citizen's arrest and make sure that their safety is paramount to be able to get the conviction. Oliver, broadly speaking, what's the legal position regarding this activity? Well, starting from the beginning, um, it, as Joe was just talking about, if they're having to arrest somebody, they are legally able to do that. The, yeah. the, the law says that if somebody has committed an indictable offence, so that's a serious offence that could go to the Crown Court, and it is necessary to detain them, and there isn't a constable available, no. then Joe is permitted, under the law of the land, to detain that person and, indeed, to use reasonable force to yes, detain yes. that person until the police attend. So um, that's at the point of arrest. In terms of the legality of the entire process, um, uh, uh, of course, we all wish that it wasn't necessary to have groups yeah. like Joe's group, yeah. um, but it seems as though it is. Um, I have uh, personally been involved in the prosecution of several offences against individuals who were discovered by paedophile hunting groups in, in my life as a criminal barrister. And what I found was that the, um, the evidence that was presented to the police, it was normally in the form of messages between the group and the sexual predator, and then video evidence of the yeah. confrontation if it turned into a situation where that person was trying to meet a child for sexual activity. Um, which, which regrettably is often the case, then they, they would video that and provide that. And I, I always found that the evidence was superbly put together. James, what is wrong with these people who want to seek out children for sexual activity? That is a very, very good question. And it, it requires a, a long and honest answer in some ways. And, and as I was saying before, as only a fraction come to attention because despite prosecution of sexual offences, we, we don't catch a lot of people or we do so a, a very long time in the future and, and from their offending and often don't take full account of everything that they've done. Um, it's, it's a difficult one to answer, but essentially what I think very, very often happens is it's in the first instance, it's about the formation of, of deviant sexual fantasy. 
um, and that very often happens in, in people's teen years. Um, they reinforce those sexual fantasies with masturbation, which is also where the link to the horrific and horrendous child sexual exploitation material comes in. And one of the things I'm very, very cautious about is that while there's a debate between sort of thinking and doing, anyone who's accessing that sort of material is showing a propensity yeah. towards um, an attraction towards, and therefore may move into that stage of actually acting out and doing. Yeah. I think the really important thing that groups like Joe are, are, are showing in some ways, and this is the indictable offence aspect as well, these are not people merely sitting and engaging in chat. They've gone through to a stage of actively going out and seeking to meet with a child, you know. And, and there is no doubt in, in those instances that, that the purpose and the motive there is to commit contact sexual offences. People do not become the most high-end sexual offenders overnight. They go through a process. That process in those that we've spoken to, courts in locked in prison custody, will start off, for example, with sometimes the stealing of women's underwear offline. Sometimes it will be the child sexual exploitation material. Sometimes it will be indecent exposure. But it escalates. And, and when paedophile hunters are engaging with people and catching them, they've escalated from that online presence and fantasy into that real world yeah, of showing a willingness reality. to do. And, and that reality needs to be dealt with. Can I add to that? Is I said uh, years ago, until these apps are threatened with multi-million pound fines, they're not going to do anything about the security. There needs to be a triple step to be able to get on one of these apps. And then the paedophile can't hide his identity and nor can the child. And then the child will never be able to get on that app. And this is this is what's killing it. It's... So the profiles that you put up, Joe, yeah. um, and you wait for contact, what apps or platforms do you use? Where do you host those? Wherever you find a child. Oh. So could that be anything. Snapchat, Instagram? Yeah, dance groups, anything. You know what I mean? They'll... They'll, they'll find the, they'll worm the way into different things, and and there's like a grooming process. It's oh you look nice today and things you know it's like little comments and then it'll get it grows and grows. Can I just add that the people that I've got on my team that do the chats are all survivors from sex abuse. Really. And this is the only therapy that they've been able to get since after their court cases. A judge turned around to one of the uh, girls in my group and said. I don't deem your dad to be a predator because he kept it in the family. That was like hurting the girl again. It's unbelievable. It's, we can get all these through into the courts, right? You'll be able to back this up. Very few go to prison. All suspended sentences. I've had a case take five years to get to court. No bill conditions, nothing. What's your most notable case? Uh, a guy in Manchester. I went to Manchester police. Um, with an evidence pack, they told me in certain terms to go back home, hand it in at home in Newcastle. So I went back to Newcastle, I tried to hand it back in at Newcastle. Didn't work. I just happened to be filming with a TV crew at the time. So I turned around, I says, listen, I can't, video, uh, I can't film for the last year. I need to go to Manchester to get this man. He's threatening rape and violence towards ch children. I says, I need to get him. I have to knock on his door to get him. I have to force the police's hand to come out and arrest this man because they took no notice of us the first time. So that's what we did. It's, it's that WhatsApp that you've been sending to yeah, people as yeah. well, threatening to beat children up if they don't do what you say, and that if you do do that, all, all they're the gonna, you're going to come to the house, you're going to rape them, you're going to rape the mother. Do not. No! Paul, no. is he OK? No! no he Bring, the Bring the ambulance! Bring the ambulance! It's against all my things. Uh, Regulation sort of thing, knocking on people's doors and things like that. But it had to be done. It literally had to be done. C can I pick up on a couple of things that Joe said? Please. First of all, I think we can all agree the fact that these cases, all criminal cases, take so long to get to the courts is a complete scandal. Yeah. Uh, and it is only the case because of the yeah. gross underfunding of our criminal yes. justice yeah. system. That's what brings it about, and it is failing victims. Oh, yeah. Um, Secondly, you mentioned about people receiving suspended sentences. In fact, m my experience from the criminal courtroom is slightly different to that. I've yeah, seen, yeah. Um, yes, um, people caught with indecent images of children yeah. will often receive a suspended sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, and that is normally done because the courts will think that if they're in prison because of the underfunding of the prison service and rehabilitation in prison, there is no prospect of them getting any help. So they There's will no give them rehabilitation a... in prison unless you serve an for four years. Precisely so. So they will. So they will not give just, them. Just... So the judge will think: if I suspend the sentence, yeah. at least this individual can be made to go to classes, can be looked after by an organisation like the Lucy Faithful Foundation, with some hope that they may mend their ways. I'm, I'm not saying that. Yeah. I'm not saying that that's right. But that is that is the logic. Yeah. Where, where you have contact offences, which are distinct from, indeed, just images cases, where an individual is going to meet, meet a, child. a child, and that is an escalation from indecent images. I think in those situations, you will normally find the person being sent to prison. There will be an immediate custodial sentence. Again, if they're not, not. Joe, in your experience, the, the reason is... Uh, the reasoning is the same. It's for the purposes of rehabilitation. No, a judge says to me one dear. He looked at us straight in the eye when I was sitting in the public gallery at one of our cases. He turned around to me and he looked. He says, if it was up to me today, I'd be sending this man to prison for quite a long time. But word from up above is preventing me from doing so today. The judge hasn't got control in his own court. He's getting told what to do. Well, Sentencing guidelines yes. and instructions. Yeah. James, my wife spent the bulk of her police career working on cases similar to this, arresting paedophiles and ended up monitoring convicted paedophiles in the community as a detective. Her standpoint is they cannot be rehabilitated. Proved. Oliver's touched on it. What's your view on that? I think rehabilitation is a very, very far-off hope in many instances because I think in, in, the, in pretty much the vast majority of all cases, you know, when someone has become fixated to a level that... that these individuals often are, yeah. then treatment... I'm, I'm very sceptical about the extent to which it works. And, indeed, we see, for example, with sex offender treatment programme that was rolled out in prisons, actually, evaluation now, although the government tried to suppress it, shows it made the individuals that were put through it worse. You know, um, the, the, the problem is when, when individuals have... And, and particularly when individuals have moved into that kind of process of, of breaking the criminal law... It's and, hard and, to change somebody's orientation. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, Very hard. And, and that's it. In many ways, what you, can, what you can attempt to do is you can attempt... To, to have people not act out on something yeah. that is essentially a very much a fundamental part of them. But the idea that you're going to kind of change that attraction and, and very often years and years and years of... of quite dark fantasies that they've had. Yeah. And, of course, they don't reveal these things these things quickly or, or often. I've, I've worked with an awful lot of, of sexual offenders, you know, Something Joe said earlier on, they're incredibly deceptive individuals, partly because society makes them that way. They're not going to tell you what they're sexually attracted to. They're not going to tell you their dark fantasies. They're very good at hiding their tracks. They're also very good at blending in and, and being perfectly legitimate, normal people. Yeah. And putting themselves in positions where they themselves... might have access to children. Absolutely. And I think, for me, that's the key in some ways. Once an individual is identified in that way, it's not about the, the, the desire to change them or not to change them. It's about safeguarding. It's about how you can ensure that that individual does not, again, have the access and opportunity to be able to put a child at risk. Joe, and, 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 and on that note, speaking more broadly, what are the plans for the Guardians of the North? Just to continue doing what we do until we're stopped by the law. Um, why should we stop protecting children? Why should we listen to the police when... You, you know, when you turn into the police to help us, there's no help there. We have to help ourselves. So it's going to continue until there's somebody govern it. And it, it, even when the government, they're not going to be able to do it properly, you know? It's, it's, it's a massive, wide-scale thing. It's up and down the country, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, everywhere in the UK. There's paedophile hunting groups around in the regions. You know, it, I still believe that the paedophile hunting teams are catching a damn sight more than what the police are actually doing. I really do. I think the numbers that are put out are just to make the public feel a little bit happier in themselves when really the reality is it's not happening. Well, thank you all very much for an enlightening and gripping conversation. Right, moving on to this week's Cop Watch. 
This week's Good Cop Spotlight goes to a group of seven police officers who successfully saved a woman's life in Dawlish. Faced with a distressing situation where the woman entered the sea in a suicidal state, these officers, led by Sergeant Mark Smith, demonstrated quick thinking and teamwork. Using two connected 25-metre throw ropes, Sergeant Mark Smith entered the water, rescued the struggling woman and, with the team's coordination, safely brought them back to shore. Hats off to all of those officers. Bad cop. And in recent disciplinary actions, two police officers faced consequences for sharing a crude and distasteful WhatsApp message related to the Nottingham attacks. The message, detailing the events of the knife rampage of last June, resulted in PC Matthew Gell receiving a final written warning, whilst another officer underwent management intervention. Anybody who disrespects the dead surely does not deserve to have a warrant card and be a police officer. All right, it's time for the part of the show where we bring you the mugs of thugs who are terrorising our streets. Have you seen these criminals? First up, do you recognise these people? The Met Police are appealing for the public's help to identify two people following a racially motivated attack in Wembley. Five 14-year-old girls were racially abused and assaulted by two older teenagers on a Route 83 bus, but thankfully no one was seriously injured. Next, we have this suspect. Ahmed Farah, who is also known as Reggie, is wanted in connection with the murder of 21-year-old Cavan Brissett in Sheffield. Mr Brissett was stabbed and died as a result of his injuries. Lastly, have you seen these men? The Met Police have released images of two men sought in connection with a violent assault on a group of women on a bus in West London. One of the victims was dragged down the stairs and off of the bus and then assaulted while the other victim sustained facial injuries. If you think you know or have seen any of these crooks, get in touch anonymously with Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Right, that's all we've got time for this week. Many thanks to James, Oliver and Joe. Be sure to leave us a comment, like and subscribe, and we'll be back next week for more Crime Suspect. <laughs> <laughs>